Uh, it's lovely to be here tonight uh, with you all and with Alex to discuss his new book that's launching on the 29th of September. Uh, before I do, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Wujak Noongar people, though, the uh, traditional custodians of the land that we, which we are gathered today, and would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, first up, Alex, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's pretty exciting. It's um, really exciting, yeah. The, the style of crime fiction for this wonderful novel, which I will put up so everyone can see, um, is often referred to as cosy crime and, and definitely reminds the reader, having just finished the book, um, of a Agatha Christie style or one of more recently the Franny Fisher detective series by Kerry Greenwood. Tell us what allured you to this form and genre. Right. Well, um, big question to big start question. with. <laughs> it's, it's good. Um, I, I've loved it for a long time, but I think one of the big things for me was, as you said, the operative word is cozy. And for a long time, well, for a long time, for about three years, um, my partner and I were traveling around the world and we lived in um, Georgia for a little while, in Mexico and in China. And it's just such a it is such a cozy, such a comforting style. You know, you sort of know what to expect. You you have that that set of rules um, where you go, okay, I know that you're going to have a um, you know gradually revealed set of clues. You're going to have some red herrings. You're going to have a sort of eccentric or charismatic amateur detective. And um, yeah, so I, I, it was just one of those things that I it felt really um, made me feel at home when I was in you know far flung places, and that. I think coming to really get to terms with that and know that um, that structure made me want to then play around with it. I found that there are a lot of ways you could kind of subvert that structure as well. And people like um, like Josephine Tay, I found really, you know, does weird things with it um, or not weird, but, you know, interesting things with it. So I thought, well, you know, move it to Australia, play around with it a bit and uh, see what happens. Yeah. I think the, the brief on the back says it's the golden age, move to the wheat belt. Yeah. So, but I think it works. Maybe it's a good time. Did you want to read um, a section of sure, the, the novel just to give people a bit of a feel for it? So I'll just start from the beginning, I think. It's, and good I'll place. go all the way to the end. We're here all night, people. <laughs> Settle in, folks. Settle in. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now, sorry, before I start, there is, there's some contention in my family. I'm not sure what the, um, what the overall consensus is on the pronunciation of Malawa. We, uh, my, my grandpa used to live in Malawa and my dad says Malawa and my grandpa said Malawa. So I'm going to say Malawa because that sounds right to me. If you are from Malawa and you disagree, um, write to Tifco, care <laughs> of Fremantle Press. Sorry, Tiff. Okay. <laughs> so here we go, the, the prologue. The house at Halfwell Station smelled of dust and dirt and heat. It hulked over sparse grasses, a heavy thing of corrugated iron and jarrah forced into foreign shapes. Making no concession to the climate, the house had been fashioned from distant memories of Lancashire, a world away, and left to collect dust on the edge of the West Australian outback. High, proud ceilings subjected the occupants to frigid winter months and summers of unbearable heat, while the wide hallways, built to be filled with the bustle of butlers and parlour maids, made unwelcome echoes of even the smallest noise. Through this hollow, half-sleeping world, on a dry November afternoon, Three sharp knocks rang like the tolling of a bell. The reverberations died away, and after a long moment of silence, a series of answering sounds emerged from the heart of the house. The scrape of a chair on aged floorboards, the creaking of hardwood, the slow growth of unhurried footsteps. Dull light swept into the hallway as the front door opened, bringing with it a hint of the dying day's heat. The lady of the house blinked out over the threshold to the grinning little man beyond. A very good evening to you, he said, bobbing his head slightly. Mrs. Harris studied the caller. He was clad in a singular brownish garment, something like a cassock or a shift, which fell almost to the ground, all but concealing the pair of battered sandals beneath. The man's face was warm, dark and weathered, shadowed by a slight beard and topped with a greying mop of curls. His eyes gleamed. Beyond and behind him, the beaten dust stretched quietly to the horizon, punctuated here and there by stubble, and scrubby stands of wattle. There was no horse or vehicle in sight. I don't suppose I could trouble you, the little man ventured, for a spot of tea. Following a moment's healthy hesitation, 
The front door swung wide to admit the stranger, then closed once more upon silence. Somewhere in the Mulga, a mile or two to the south, a corpse lay slowly cooling. Mm. There you are. And then chapter one is mm. next. <laughs> That's a, a good place to finish. It, uh, you know, um, when I, I was reading the, the novel, obviously it's set in 1927, mm -hmm. um, writers often write about what they know, particularly with their first novels. I moisturise, yeah. I look <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty sure you weren't around in 1927. You, you alluded to your grandpa just then. Tell us a little bit how the research behind this novel came about and, and what did it, you know, your, your grandpa's influence in it? Yeah, no worries. So um, my grandpa was not quite that old. He was born in 1926, so he yeah, would have been one when this was set. But um, he grew up all around that area. He was actually from um, Victoria, and then he sort of bounced around uh, Malawa, Mount Magnet, uh, Geraldton, uh, all that, that sort of region. Um, and about maybe 10 or so years ago now, he started trying to write his memoirs. And um, he got me to type them, and he was he was so amazed by my, you know, like word processing. He was I think he used a um, a typewriter, and that was that was as far as he got technology wise. So he was just like, oh my god, he's doing this, and it's coming up on the screen. It's amazing. So it was pretty easy to impress him, which was good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now his stories didn't have any murder in them. Not he, if he did murder anyone, he didn't tell me. <laughs> um, he didn't want to commit that paper. But he, um, he just had these, you know, bizarre stories. Some of them I didn't quite believe. Um, I think he was exaggerating a lot of them um, and maybe, you know, trying to make himself sound better in a lot of them. But um, it was more the, the area than any particular story that sort of inspired me to try and set something there. Because when I thought about, you know, I've got family from the country, other family as well. And when I go to country towns and things and when I think about Australian history, I, I think of old white guys in hats and um it wasn't like that at all uh, you know in his stories he had um sort of missionaries from all the mediterranean countries there's a lot of people from the middle east um especially um in the, with the camel trade you know in, in the higher north when you get up to Broome, of course there's the japanese pearl divers um there was a he was actually taught to catch crayfish by an old Chinese man. So it was a really interesting, it was just a lot more vibrant than I expected. I thought, you know, small town, wheat belt, dust, dead, everything's just kind of a bit bleak. And of course there is a bleakness to it, which works well with, with, with uh, crime. But I just was surprised at the way that the gold fields and the, the ports, you know, brought so many different people together. And I thought, what an interesting contrast, mm. what an interesting place to, to, to try and set a story. Yeah, definitely. Um, the when you say bringing people together, mm. the the four main characters in the story that end up forming part of like an inve investigative team sure. uh, are from vastly different backgrounds. Did you want to um, give a little bit of an explanation as to the four characters? Yeah. So because um... <laughs> they add so much richness to the story, they're different backgrounds as well. I think. Yeah, they're they're a weird they're a weird bunch. Um, mm. <laughs> so basically, you've got. Um, Mariana Harris, who is the sort of adopted daughter of the station owners, and she's she's young, she's 18, she's um, just kind of discovering the world. She's lived on the station, um, which I don't think I ever speci specify, but it's supposed to be a sheep, a sheep station. I, um, <laughs> uh, so she's had quite a, a narrow um, experience of life, and she gets all her... Um, which would have been suitable for the time. Yeah, sure. And for someone like that anyway. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think it's, you wouldn't expect a lot more of that, a lot more than that really. Um, so she's kind of, I, I like her as a character because she is, she's very um, bolshy maybe is the word. Mm -hmm. I find that a lot of people, uh, you know, my mum grew up in, in Narraj and I find that a lot of um, girls who grow up in the country, uh, you know, they, they have to, <laughs> my mum always described it as, she did all the men's work without getting any of the benefits. So she she learned to, you know, fight a lot and be very And sort of being the only child. Really and being an only well. child too would be a part of it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it's quite interesting, I think, from her perspective, because when she goes to Malawa, which is still quite a small place and was uh, you know, actually possibly a bit larger in nineteen twenty six because of all the 
the um, goldfields traffic. Mm. Don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> but you know, to her, that's a that's a bustling metropolis. You know, they've got touring um, cinema shows and they've got all this sort of stuff that's like, wow, this is massive. But of course, you know, to us, we think of it as you know, like a small town and, and remote and all that stuff. So that was quite fun. Um, you've got Cooper, who's a, an indigenous tracker. I think that's kind of a pretty that's a staple of these uh, books set in this era. You know, mm. having the I think a lot of the things that um, a lot of the movies that have um, come out recently was it Sweet Country uh, last mm. year, a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, had mm. you know um, centered around an indigenous tracker. There was a lot of stuff in. See rabbit proof fence, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that sort of, and he's, um, you know, I think he, he's just um, trying to trying to get by without without raising the ire of of um, of Parks too much. And Parks is is the sort of detective, and he's. I wanted to sort of lampoon detective sergeant. Detective, exactly, he yeah. sounds pretty. Um, adamant about his title making sure people don't forget <laughs> he is and unfortunately if you know as i said there's not a lot of my grandpa in the story it's mostly in the setting but if i i was kind of gently sending him up in a lot of that because he was very he was a, an english teacher and he was very sort of you know this is this is proper this is the way you do things he um he would say at, at you know really emotional family events when people were you know when there were births when there were deaths things like this he would greet you by saying regards and then when you left, you would say, carry on, um, which was just so white, you know, <laughs> such, you know such, a, such an old, old British man. But he, he wasn't even British, but he, he thought he was. Um, so, and I had a lot of love for him. I don't, I don't mean to, to, um, send know, him up to, too much. Yeah, send him up too much. But it was, it was a sort of a, a bit of a, a loving caricature in that way. But also, yeah, all of the, um, all of the, I think. That, that standard, again, talking about cosy crime, there's always the the professional detective who kind of has to be a foil to the amateur detective who actually knows what's going on, you know, and he's going, no, 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 I know how this is done, you know, you, and, and uh, he doesn't. <laughs> so he's, he's a, you know, he's a lot of fun to just kind of just make fun of, really. Um, and he's, you know, a bit ridiculous and a bit set in his ways. And then you've got the friar who, or the mendicant, depending on, sort of go back and forth on what I call him. Yeah, you do. Um, <laughs> but is that because one of the big features of his character is... He doesn't have a name. He doesn't have a name. He's got no name. Yeah, so he's, that's, I, I talked about this actually with Rebecca Higgy on the podcast a while ago. Um, that's just a cheap, that's just a cheap tactic to make him seem more mysterious, you know. She, she asked, I did a few, you know, I've done a few interviews and a few conversations and no one had ever actually asked me. And then she said, why does he not have a name? And I went, I don't know. I think I just, Has it, just. Have you read something else where that was part of the story? Uh, or only, you... only Doctor Who, to be honest. I right. think I think it might have, I think I might have nicked it from Doctor Who because I was going, why, you know, when she asked me this and I went, why does he not have a name? And I thought, where did I get that from? And I think, oh yeah, Doctor Who, like. Um, you always get the, the thing where he, you know, he busts into a situation which is already chaotic and people go, who are you? And he goes, I'm the doctor. And they go, that's not a name. What? Ah, and it, it already <laughs> automatically puts people on the back foot and it makes everything just a bit more mysterious and weird. But with the friar, his whole thing is that he's given his name up. You know, you get all the different um, sort of, well, like the mendicant orders. So that all the, you know, like St. Francis of Assisi and so on, all of these traveling um, sort of like, they're not quite priests, but sort of like, um, you know, Catholic orders. Um, and they, you know, they, they give things up. They won't drink. They won't, um, they'll wear hair shirts or they, they'll give up alcohol. You know, they'll do this sort of quite, you know, quite intense shows of, of um, penitence or whatever you want to call it. And I thought that'd be a good, um, that'd, be, that'd be a good sort of taking that to the extreme. It's just saying, like, I don't have an identity anymore. I'm just a... I'm just a just a beggar, basically. Mm. So yeah, he's he's an interesting, and he's obviously got a lot of backstory that I won't talk about because you've got to buy the book and read it. Yeah, okay? true. I'm not telling you, um, there are. I mean, I think that really does illustrate the quirkiness of these four characters that come together, and and you allude in that beginning bit. Um, can we tell those yeah in uh, Facebook land? Any more how the story goes into, particularly because um, Mariana or Anna, as we come to refer to her in the in the novel, mm -hmm. she's as as you've already said, she's eighteen. Um, she's the only adopted daughter mm -hmm. of, of the Harrises, and um, 
I actually don't think we find out Mrs. Harris's name, do we, in the story? Not that I I was trying to check because I because it's Neville Harris is her father who who is one of those characters who likes to answer all yeah. the questions regardless of who's actually being the question being directed to. Yeah, he's the centre. He thinks he's the centre. Of the and so we've got eighteen year old Anna, and she. Um, she loves reading. Mm-hmm. She's, she's quite a romanticist in that scenario. And she does, um, she likes looking at the stars and the sky. And further through the story, she has a romantic notion about the ocean. Mm. And just when you were describing the characters then, um, one other aspect of her character we know that she's adopted, is that her parents are from Santiago. Yeah. And she has this, I think that feeds into her romanticist idea of the ocean and how the ocean is just a wee tiny thing that separates Geraldton and Santiago. Yeah, it's just, just there. You can it's just... just, yeah, a small hop and a skip. Yeah. I, I think you played that to her character perfectly. Um okay. But in, in saying all of that, which helps give us a bit of an idea of who she is, mm. did you want to explain how she's out stargazing? Because that brings in the two things. We've, we've heard about the friar who appears on the doorstep and the other interesting thing that makes this novel its mystery. Sure. So basically, yeah, as, as you said, she's a really, um, she's very wrapped up. Her character is is all about romance about stories that her whole experience of the world is from is from books so she has this quite almost exaggerated idea of what the world is like you know um but it's also um that because she's looking for she's looking for a sense of self she's looking for an identity because she is she knows that she's adopted she knows a little bit about her adoptive parent about her biological parents knowing that they came from from chile and you know, she's not given much more than that. So she's kind of trying to build up this this backstory for herself, and she tries to, um, you know, she got she she um, learns Spanish. She sort of teaches herself Spanish with with a um, with the aid of a, a guy who lives in town and things like that that she gets to visit once a month. Um, so yeah, the the idea of her stargazing, of her going out at night, is is partly something that that she really does. That she um, um that she is. You know, you know, she's staring at the stars and going, "Oh, it's a, it's a huge world. It's a wide world out there." I know all the stories about these stars from from um, you know, from ancient Greek books and things like that. But um, it's also a lie because she's wandering around for another reason that you, again, I won't tell you. Um, <laughs> but while she is wandering around um, at night using stargazing as use, she stumbles across a body. And yeah, as you said, the central mystery of the story is that she's wandering around. Quite a long way away from her, from her home, which is in itself a long way from Malawa, which is again quite a long way from everywhere else. It's pretty, pretty remote, and there's a, a body. She basically trips over a a corpse, a man that she doesn't know, and no one else seems to know either. And no one seems to be missing a, a man. <laughs> she goes, anyone has anyone lost this uh, dead guy? Um, <laughs> so she goes and she. Um, you know, sort of raises the alarm, and that's when the the detective, etc., come out to to find out what's going on. But when everyone gets there, and she runs to show them, look, this is where I found the guy. Um, he's gone, and that's the. So if this was a movie, this would be where it goes. Be... Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so she's she's going. No, everyone, you know, I've got everyone out. Come with me. Follow me out into the bush, and then it's, there's nothing there. And so the the idea is, who is this man? How did he die? Where did he come from and how Where's did he, he disappear? Gone? Yeah, how mm. did he get up and, and wander off again? Uh, do you know, reading through the novel, there really are some lovely moments of wry humour that are dotted throughout. Um, in particular, the moustache of uh, Detective Sergeant Arnold Parks, which um, almost deserves its own postcode, really, by the sounds of it. Is it easy to work in those little bits of wit Um is it easy or is it something that requires a lot of rewriting of the story and that sort of thing? I'd get a sense it's part of your personality anyway. Would I be right? Um, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, I like to, I like to think that everything's funny. I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that you, that you found that funny, first of all, because a lot of things I find funny 
people don't find funny. Uh, <laughs> things I'll go, oh my God, guys, look at this. And everyone sort of goes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I, I almost kind of went the other way in terms of I have to sort of make things less less jokey, I suppose. My, my, my innate, my favorite book is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, you know, the, the things I love to read to relax are, um, other than cozy crime, like PG Woodhouse and things like that. And they're all very, you know, the way they look at the world is kind of inherently funny. They're basically saying, look at this ridiculous place we live, look at these ridiculous people we are, and look at the ridiculous way we, we all behave. Um, but I, I think I have to tone that down a bit, obviously with a, with a, um, with a murder mystery because you want to have some element of suspense or, or fear or something, you know, you don't want it to be completely farcical. So I suppose that's kind of my, my challenge is that instead of, instead of kind of going through it again and, and looking for things that are funny, I end up sort of going and taking out shit jokes really. <laughs> just going, that one's not strong enough. And also too many, it, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a bit rubbish. So. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think if you talk to, um, Georgia, my editor, she would, she'll, she'll have a lot of, a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor there that she went, this is just, this is not, this is not good. This is not funny or, or this is just not appropriate. <laughs> well, that's why you have a good editor. Exactly. That's why. <laughs> um, I just want to remind everybody, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions as well that we can file away at um, Alex to answer. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to pop those through because they'll pop up on the screen and I can ask um, Alex when we see them, which I will do so shortly. Um, I'm going to take you back to the beginning of the book because there is an author note that acknowledges the original inhabitants of the land on which you write and the historical context of some of the attitudes that appear in your novel. Tell us about the challenges and responsibilities um, as you see in writing a novel with this in mind. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's, it is, I was very conscious of, of that when we put the, put the note in here. Um, I said sort of while the events in the story are fictional, the locations and the historical context aren't, and then sort of go on and talk about prejudices and, and um, sovereignty and things. I mean, it's, I don't know. It's 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 a, it's a hard thing because, on the one hand, you don't want to say, "Look at nineteen twenty six, sorry, 1927 Western Australia. Everything was rosy. Everyone was holding hands and singing. Uh, you know, Indigenous people were celebrated, and um, and everyone had a great time. Uh, because in doing that, you're obviously erasing a lot of just terrible, you know, uh, terrible things that people were subjected to, terrible attitudes, even." Um, just the casual, you know, like the, uh, one of the things I find when you read Agatha Christie now, Naya Marsh, um, you know, all, all the things from the 30s and 40s, there's just the casual racism and sexism and homophobia and, you know, just general prejudice that was around there. It just kind of, for me, it just, it just takes the wind out of you because as I said, it's such a cozy thing. You're so like, ah, this is fun. Do, 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 do. And you're imagining kind of like, you know, the Charleston in the background and it's all, it's all uh, fun and games and then you'll get a, you know, a racial slur or a like, oh, it's okay, that person died because they're gay or something. And you're like, whoa. And it really sort of um, reading now, you know, really, really uh, takes you out of it. So I did want to not do that. I, did, I didn't want to make people uncomfortable, but I also didn't want to sweep under the rug all this, um, you know, all this awful stuff. So basically what I tried to do was have certain characters, again, Detective Sergeant Parks, um, basically in his, um, attitudes and the way he talks about people and everything without using sort of aggressive language, just the way he's casually dismissive of people's experiences or sort of going, oh, you know, he says that, but you know, he would do that. He's a native or whatever, you know, you sort of got, you, 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 he demonstrates the ideas of the time. And, um, I tried to have other people challenge that, or even just in the narrative voice, just sort of go, Whoa, look at this guy, you know? <laughs> which yeah um i think I you did it what... i think you did it really well and really respectfully um, and i'm particular talking about the, the there's a, a scene where they're all boarding a train and it's it was 
it was a slap in the face as it as it should have been because you you are likened to Anna's experience of what she was seeing. Mm. This here's this girl that's been pretty much holed up on a station for all of her eighteen years, sure. and she's you know embarking out in the world, and she doesn't understand the prejudices, sure. and and it's really evident. But it was done really well, so Thank you. I think that's great. And and also as I alluded to before, that we never find out Mrs. Harris's name. Yeah. You know, um, apart from it's Mrs. Harris. Um, yeah, exactly. And I think, a... you know, it just reminds us of of where where the world was in 1927. And it, you wouldn't have been true to that period of time if you didn't highlight those aspects. So I think it's important and it's been done really well, I thought. Yeah, well, yeah, again, it, it is hard because I don't, I feel like often people use that as an excuse, you know, like you often hear... Um, not literature, but, but um, Quentin Tarantino, you know, loves to sort of throw around racial slurs and have sort of really, you know, awful stuff in there and be like, that's, you know, that's the way it was. That's realistic. And it's like, that is true. But we do have a choice in in what we, you know, portray and the way the way things go. Things have changed a lot, but I think things still need to change a lot. In yeah, definitely. Regards. And so... it's, I think people are more aware of that, that sort of stuff now. But um, yeah, it's, it's always going to be hard to strike that balance, I suppose, because at the end of the day, usually a book's written by one person and that person is, you know, has their own identity. You know, the, the, in my case, I'm, I'm white, I'm male, I'm largely straight. Um, but it's, um, you know, so I can either write a bunch of characters who are exactly the same as me. But, it, you know, even if I was just going to write straight white, uh, white male characters, you know, it's not going to be, they're not going to be, realistic either because i'm not like you know yeah. every other person we're all we're all individuals so i guess you're always going to have to try and step out of your comfort zone and write characters that aren't um you i always find i don't know if you've seen the there's always a thread going around on twitter that comes back again and again of like um just women being written really badly by men have you ever seen, like seen those one you know it's just like just you know like especially i think in the like noir kind of things where they have like the femme fatales and stuff and they're just always like really aware of their breasts. You know, she's like, she walked to the door, her breasts moving. And you're like, why? What? <laughs> like they, they always have these, these shocking kind of descriptions of women. And I was like, okay, well, there's one thing I can definitely avoid doing. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, yeah. <laughs> See, we're talking about you. It's actually um, probably a good time. I wanted to go back to a little bit about you and how you came to writing. Um, so you have written advertising copy for pool cleaners and yeah. concrete supply companies. You've taught English in Joseph Stalin's hometown and you almost managed to read half of James Joyce Ulysses twice. I'm assuming that's the first half. You didn't sort of think to read the first half and then the second half. I skipped around. It was a weird yeah. time. Okay. <laughs> You've written for news outlets, travel journals, marketing companies and educational providers. And this is your first novel. So tell us how you came to be a writer. Um, I, I've always written stuff. I've always loved writing and, and reading and I was really lucky in that my family really, you know, my mum and dad read to me um, as a kid. Uh, we had a house full of books. I loved that all the time. Um, so when I graduated, I decided to, I was like, what can writers do? And I made the uh, really prescient, um, forward thinking move of studying print and radio journalism. You know, the, mm. two, the two types of journalism that are going to thrive on into the future. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> so I did that and, um, yeah, I worked for, I did it in internship at, um, the newspaper and, and, um, didn't have a great time. It was a bit too, um, predatory for me, for me, you know, that I had to go to go and send me one of my first assignments was like a woman whose ki two kids were killed in a car crash and I went, go over and get a statement, ask her how she feels. And I thought I can guess how she feels yeah. and it's not going to be like, yeah. um, yeah. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't really, um. I wasn't very good at that. Yeah, fair <laughs> so I, I went into copywriting instead. And as I said, I worked for advertise, um, an advertising company for a few years and wrote all sorts of <clears throat> really thrilling stuff about dust suppression systems and um, just really exciting industrial things. Um, and then I, I went to teaching instead. So that's when I started traveling around the world. Mm -hmm. That's how we ended up in, in Georgia and China and everywhere. And now I'm you know, back here. I'm teaching. Um, um, trying to juggle, you know, the writing and the teaching. And um, I've, I've written, this is my first novel, obviously, to be published. I've tried, I've written another. You've got other manuscripts there? I have, I have two 
manuscripts which will never see the light of day as long as I have my faculties because they're so god awful. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I look every now, every couple of years, I look back. I just open that word document again and go, oh, and I, I read about three three paragraphs and just go, oh, okay. But if you hadn't have done those, you it, might have not maybe, got maybe to these. Yeah. So <laughs> it all it all it all works towards this result. Possibly. So was it when you were writing your um, memoirs for your grandpa? Was that when was that the, the when the seed was planted, or did it start even earlier? Do you think for this for this, for this yeah. One? Um, and how long has it taken to write this? Good question. That's sort of what I'm thinking. So, no, I started, I, I kind of just put that on the back burner. I was literally just typing his memoirs. I wasn't, there was no sort of, you know, input from me. He was just talking at me and I was going, okay. Um, and, and I kind of put that aside and, and then forgot about it for a while. And then, um, yeah, as I said, it was when I was overseas and reading or like just, just in, like I, I have insomnia as well. I, I don't sleep, so I, I'd often read like two, you know, Agatha Christie's in a night or something, and then um, I was just barreling through all these these ebooks, especially um, ebooks at Adelaide had this great thing where all the all the Josephine Tay and things like that were all you know out of out of copyright, so you could just download them all in bulk and just be like whoa, plow through them. And I thought I could do this at about three o'clock in the morning one night. I thought I think I can do you know drunk on sleeplessness um and i yeah so i think i first started right like uh, trying to put a plot together when i was in in georgia in old mate joseph stalin's hometown um and then i thought you know where where am i going to put this and i thought they're all in london i don't know much about london so what can i you know where's a good place to to transplant the story i kind of had the mechanism the central sort of idea of the, the mystery you know like you know, what's going to happen and why it's going to be mysterious and how it'll be resolved and I thought, where can I plonk this? And uh, yeah, that's when I sort of went, oh yeah, Grandpa's thing was really interesting. Also, actually, sorry, I just realized I said there was no murder in Grandpa's memoirs. There was. It wasn't him who murdered or got murdered. Someone didn't murder the mustache, did they? No one murdered the mustache. <laughs> um, no, but uh, there was the, the Murchison murders sort of happened while he was um, in the area just, just before he got there. And it was very interesting. So, so I don't know if you've heard of it. It was um, Arthur Upfield, who was who was a um, crime writer in Australia. Well, he wasn't. I don't know if he was Australian, but he was he was writing in Australia at the time. He basically told a guy he was working with. He was he he published a few novels already, and he was having a conversation with a, a guy at the near the rabbit proof fence, and he said, "I've got this great idea. My next novel. What's going to happen? Here's how the guy's going to going to murder them, and here's how he's going to hide the evidence and get away with it." And then about a few months later, the guy who told that stole his modus operandi and went and killed a few people um, using his using his idea. And it was quite uh, I think he, it was something like you know burning the burning the bodies and and crushing up the ash with with the bones of animals or something to disguise it. And then like, it was a, this whole involved thing. But I remember my grandpa just going, "That was a bit weird." And he was going, "Oh, you know, we we lived here and we moved to this farm. Actually, that was where that that you know the Murchison murders happened." And I went, "Oh." It's a bit grisly, so yeah, that popped up in my mind again afterwards when I was thinking of where to where to put the uh, where to put the murder. I thought, well, so could we see those in book two? Is, are we going to see a book two with these little characters as well? We're going to. So I'm working on the second one, mm -hmm. um, but it's only got one of the characters. It's only got the friar. I thought he would, he had the most kind of um, ability to move around and kind of you know insinuate himself in the new situations because he kind of just floats He's, from place to yeah. place. Yeah, being being mysterious. Um, so yeah, um, um, it's very different. As oh, sorry, I didn't answer your question completely before. It took me about two and a half years to write this one, right. before just kind of you know at yeah. night when I couldn't sleep and so on. And now because of COVID, thanks COVID, um, I've got you know more free time. I'm working two or three days a week. So mm -hmm. now I'm sort of trying to do a dedicated effort to actually try and write every every week, and it's really different. Um, yeah, well, if you're used to writing at between twelve and three in the morning, exactly. Does it take a a different sort of preparation to spend during um, the day doing it yeah i mean it, it feels it feels wrong <laughs> it feels I you put curtains down and make <laughs> yeah. it seem like it's blackout um it's almost like yeah it's, it's just really different so I'm, I'm not sure how if this is what i'll stick with mm -hmm. um or but you know but i'll give it a shot and hopefully the second one works out and it's not rubbish uh, otherwise i have to um you know 
start caffeinating and get back into sleeplessness. And, yeah, yeah, you will. <laughs> Has there been any sniffing around of anyone signing up for any screen rights at all? Because these are typically, you know, do really well yeah. putting them into to film or series. Not that I've heard of. We're doing, a, um, I've just been told that we're doing a, um, an audio book. So that's mm -hmm. cool. Are you going to be reading that? I don't know, actually. I, mm. was, this was just like last week. I just got an email going to someone saying, oh, yeah, audio book's happening. So I was like, hmm, maybe I should do it. That'd be fun. Mm. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't. Do you think it would work as a. Yeah, I think so. I suppose it could work. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Do it. Screen Someone, rights. someone do it. <laughs> um, let's see what questions we've got coming up here. Should we do some. Um, this two truths and a lie thing as well? I didn't get to see the message, so oh, right. get I, far I've away. Got, I, got a, I got a message that said. Uh, so. Um, we did this. Did you see the two, two truths and a lie thingy before on the on Facebook? No, I okay. didn't. So basically, I recorded a video and I had three stories from my life, and people had to guess which ones which oh. one was a lie. Two of them are true, and one of them is a lie. Uh -huh. So we had um, a few people uh, guessing in here. We had about twenty odd um, guesses. I'm tallying up here in a deeply scientific sort of election night style. Um, notebook <laughs> and just to briefly recap we had um me getting bitten by a fox and contracting a strange unknown disease we had me accidentally pouring concrete into my boots and um stick and having them stuck to my feet and having to pry them off and, and soak them and we had me heading out to sea on a windsurfer before i learned how to turn around um so <laughs> that's the that was three, and we had um, quite a few people. Most people actually thought that the false one was the concrete boots story, which unfortunately was not false. I am that dumb. Um, <laughs> so I, I did. Oh yeah, I was working on a construction site and didn't realise that the concrete was leaking out of the um, out of the mixer, and it went to the top of my boots, and it hardened, and I had to soak it and. Uh, you know, in sort of like hot water and chip away at it and ruin that pair of boots. And I've still got some concrete sort of in scars on my feet there. It's sort of a little exciting reminders of, of that stupidity. So sorry, the eight people who thought that it was concrete boots, unfortunately that was, um, that was real. The other one that surprisingly was real was the fox. Um, yeah, there used to be a lot of foxes around Point Walter. I went there on a picnic and had my shoes off and, um, <laughs> and um, some baby, so I get, I'm guessing they were young because they're very playful. Foxes came out, one of them bit me. And um, we thought it was hilarious at the time. Didn't really think much of it. And then a few, maybe like a month later, I had this horrible rashy thing um, on my leg and, and the doctor didn't really know what it was. Um, I didn't say anything about the fox bite. I don't know why, because I was an idiot, because I was a teenager. <laughs> um, I, didn't make, I didn't put two and two together. It'd been a month that I already moved on. I've forgotten about it. Um, but it was uh, trichophyte and mentagrophytes, which is apparently Ooh. something you usually only get from like the very wild um, dogs or, or rabbits, but apparently foxes as well. So there you go. And then next time I had a, uh, a family, we had a family dinner with some, some family friends who uh, have something to do with the department of, uh, you know, like the, the, the environment or whatever, the Parks and Wildlife Service. And they said, you'll be pleased to know after you told us you got bitten by that fox, we instituted a baiting program. We've killed... 1200 foxes or something and I went no I'm not pleased to know that it makes me feel horrible that makes me mm. <laughs> that we can... but I mean yeah I know that they're regardless so the fake story is the one about turning it going out to sea on a windsurfer before I let's turn around um it didn't, didn't really happen <laughs> I've got I've got nothing for you so we had um five people who um guessed that one correctly uh, Tiff, do you want me to to just to, to choose one of those five to, to win, or you will do that later? We'll do it later. Okay. We'll, so we'll keep everyone in suspense. Keep everyone in suspense. I think. But good job to those five people who did. Um, well done. Who did guess correctly that I uh, didn't didn't get stranded on a windsurfer? Well done. <laughs> okay, we do have some questions that okay. have come through, and Tiff's very um, good in putting them on some paper for me. Yep. Did you write this first book with a series actually in mind, and how did that affect your choices with plot and character? Uh, no, no, I wrote this first book with the um, expectation that it would be garbage and that no one would ever want to look at it. So uh, it was a pleasant surprise. 
that people did want to read it. Did you really think that? I did. No, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because, again, previous two stories, very, yeah. very bad. But no, um, I'm just i just not a very confident person, to be honest. I just I just thought I was, I was doing it for me. I was just doing something that I thought, I'll see if I can do this and it will be um, something to do. Something to do while I'm not sleeping, um, which is what a writer has to do. It's not. It's not necessarily about writing. Yeah. To get something to be published, it's because they need to write. So have the confidence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, when they when um, when Georgia said she wanted to publish it, and she said one of the first things she said was, you know, have you thought about a series? What are you doing the the next one? And I went, I don't know. <laughs> I'll get back to you on that. So you know, no is the answer. But maybe yes. Now. But now, now yes, yeah. Now that now that I've seen that that um, there's at least uh, how many people we got online, at least fifteen people who are interested. Um, then yeah, I'm gonna write another one. Cool. Okay, we have another question here. Do you have a strong sense of where the series is heading? No, uh, as per as per previous question, um, I don't know. But I I do know. I've, I've had a time to think about it now, and the friar as I said, is going to be the sort of constant. Um, and I suppose he... Um, I won't give things away. Yeah, no, I, I suppose it's about him him coming to terms with himself. His whole, his whole thing, as we said, is that he's given up his name, he's wandering around, he's all sort of basically shoeless and penniless, and he's a, he's a penitent. He feels <clears throat> very... Um, very sort of lost in terms of identity. And so I suppose... Um, what will happen as he um, meets more people and, and travels more and, and, and sort of discovers he, well, I guess he's already discovered he has a talent for sort of trying to, you know, <clears throat> solve problems. He will um, try and try and come to terms with himself and try and feel that he maybe deserves happiness as well. Mm -hmm. I suppose would be the, yeah, the main idea. So then it's sort of as part of that question as well, um, there are, are two types of writers typically they can be referred to as plotters or pantsers as in you plot the story or you write by the city of pants which do you think you fall into i hmm that's a good question um hmm. did you know the ending as you started even if I, it was loose no i didn't actually no I, I i knew again i knew the mechanics of it i guess i guess what's what's specific to this kind of genre is that there's the the whole you know usually the the way it was done the mm. you know the trick the the I don't know I, yeah I think of it as kind of like the the mechanical because it is it, it's it's almost like a um, like a like a hidden you know like a secret sort of switch or something and then you, you finally sort of reveal it and then go oh that's right because he was there and that was all um, so I kind of had that in um, but it's a very when I when I started the last one, and when I start when I started the one I'm working on now, um, it's it's quite devoid of character, I suppose. It's it's more like the physically, you know, a person is here, a person is there. The trick is going to be that, you know, they were actually here, or that person wasn't real, or whatever is going on. Um, and then when I actually started writing, I was like, you know, th then I, I start writing and think, okay, so who? who would make sense to be here and, and who would make sense to be the person who was hidden here and, and how would that all work? So a bit of both, I suppose, a bit of bit of um, having it plotted out, but then mostly kind of... Letting it just organically yeah. sort of come out, which I think can... I don't know, I think from when I was reading through it and the, the truth is being unveiled to you as the reader, mm. it's not... Um, it's not just like a big reveal in a chapter. It actually just seeps its way out sure and i think it adds to the um the the drama of it and and the mystery so well that's good that that worked mm. yeah no, <laughs> that, worked. that worked tick to do that yeah. one again right. <laughs> no, it, um, yeah and I, de I definitely wasn't afraid to go back and fix things as well that was that was something i had to learn pretty quickly i used to be very very precious about like i have spent you know, I spent a whole night writing this chapter. I'm not going to just throw that away. But then you have to just go look if it's if it's not working, or if you want, you know, if you go, oh, hang on, it would be better if this person was secretly in love with this person or whatever. You just go, all right, get rid of that. So what I do now is actually, um, 
every time I start writing, I open up my Word document and I save a new copy with the, that day's date. And then I go, if I delete anything, if I go, no, I have to get rid of all this, it's all, it's all in the previous one. You know, it's, it's, it's all saved there somewhere. So if I really decide that I need to go back, oh, I need to find that absolute beast of genius. And of course, I, I never do because none of it's ever you know, that good. You need to be like, I absolutely must get this to the world. Um, you can always you know, write something else that, that works just as well. <laughs> We've got some questions coming thick and fast here. How do you research the era? Has your research led to any surprises? Yes, so many, so many surprises. Um, well, in addition to, as I said, there's Grandpa, but Grandpa was, you know, by the time he was actually doing stuff, it was about 25 years after what we're talking. So mostly it's Trove, the old, the old National Library of Australia Trove thing, which is so good. Oh, I get lost in there for so long. Um, so you, you, you know, can just choose a choose a date, choose a newspaper, and go in and and read all of the stuff that was happening. And they did not have. Uh, you know, a standard of journalistic ethics then. So it's great. You get a lot of excellent, um, I'm trying to remember what the, oh, there was a newspaper called Truth, all in capitals, um, that we had in WA, I think until about the 40s or 50s. And um, anything in Truth on on, uh, <laughs> on Trove is, is amazing. You go there, it's just like, you know, we send out a journalist to break into a, a home for the disabled and uh, see how much he could steal and... And you're sort of going, what's the point of this story? Is this actually a, an expose? Or is this just people bored and they needed something to write about? Um, but yeah, so there's so many things I was surprised. I mean, you know, there's a lot we don't really think about. One of the things I was really surprised to find was um, phones. About phones. There we had in Albany, I think it was Albany. It was one, one, of, the, one of the towns down south. Um, they had an x-ray machine before they had the phone line. Wow. Which is, I think about x-rays as being, maybe it's just the letter X, it just sounds very science fiction. I think about x-rays as being, you know, pretty recent and advanced and stuff. But then I guess, I guess they had them, you know, before they had, I think they had like a, you know, one line to the post office or whatever before, but before, you know, people had phones in their houses down, you know, in Katanning or Kojinup or wherever, they, they could go in and get x-rays. And I was like, that's, that's really surprising to me. That's a shocking um, thing. The other thing, um, as someone who studied journalism, is how many newspapers we used to have. Mm, it's amazing. Idea. Yeah, because I mean, we you know now it's it's the West and the Sunday Times from from WA really. If you're not you know as well as the local papers, but um, you you look back there and they had so you know every town had or every region had quite a large one as well as the local ones. And in Perth, we just had you know we, they had in the 20s they would have had about 10 dailies and a couple of weeklies and it was, just, it was amazing how many newspapers we had especially considering that it was a much smaller population then. Mm. yeah so, yeah it's, it's a changing time yeah, definitely isn't okay. it uh we have another question here we've probably got time for a couple more will we find out more about the friar's background yeah Good, actually. <laughs> Having true. been one that's read it, um, he's a very interesting character. Mm. Yeah, well, in the in this story, you know, there's obviously some kind of broad stroke stuff. You, you do find out later in the story about, um, you know, where, where he's from and sort of a, a bit about what's going on with him. But, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot more that I've that I have in my, my mental image of him that I will, that I'd like to, to explore. Um, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Apart from your grandpa, um, where and how did you source historical accuracy, e.g. social structures and police procedures? Good question. Um, so. You didn't just make them up. I did, well, hmm. <laughs> Some of it I did just make up. Um, I did it just just reading a lot from the from the era, and you know you've got. Um, I wish people often uh, talk to me now about um, Solari Gentile mm -hmm. and um, and the Franny Fisher books. Mm. Um, I actually I've read one Franny <laughs> Fisher book before I before I wrote this, but I'd actually never read any of Solari Gentiles, and I've read a lot more um, Franny Fisher stuff now since doing it, and I've kind of gone, oh, that would have been really useful beforehand because it's already got. A lot of the stuff that I spent a long time researching. Um, the Frio police, uh, the Frio police, the West Australian police have um, some good sort of history mm -hmm. um, documentation, I suppose. That's on um, 
that is on their website and in the state library. I spend a lot of time in the state library. Mm. They've got a lot of, um, they have a really good sort of um, history and genealogy section. So there's a lot you can look at there and um, you know, a lot of other people's autobiographies and things like that. Um, my grandpa, I, I don't think had much to do with the police, so I didn't get a lot from there. Um, but also I just tried to keep it pretty broad. I didn't go into, you know, the, the detective comes out from, from Geraldton to investigate um, so there's not a lot of like, you know, at the station, this is how all the mm -hmm. report filing works and everything. It was just kind of like, you know, I'm just going to imagine that that works. And then um, I'll have my editor and proofreader to uh, pull me up on bits and pieces, which they did. <laughs> Go, that's not real. Um, this is an interesting question. I'm, oh. I'm guessing that someone, perhaps even a family member or friend who may have read some of the novel. Okay. has asked this question. I don't have the names on here. Okay. <laughs> but this question, uh, were pigs harmed in the writing of this book? <laughs> um, okay, so that's... Uh, I'm trying to figure out how much I want to give away of the, of the throw there. No. Um, <laughs> it's... It's a weird thing, yeah, the, the, the pig thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, do you think it's too much of a giveaway to go into, or is it...? Uh, I think you could probably just, the answer to that's no, but it's, it's an interesting, um, how, how to talk about the, well, I mean, the, the impact of why the pigs are sort of there, because how on earth did you find that out? Like, um, Look, this is going to sound incriminating, but that was, that was grandpa. Uh, he, look, here's, here's his story. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that it's no one in our family believes him, but he, used to ride horses on his on the farm that he was on. And he claims that one of his, that once he was told to catch an emu, I'm, I should say, in, in light of the fox thing as well, the reason I was so upset about the fox thing, I'm, I've been vegetarian since I was 15 um, and vegan on and off. I, I'm very sort of like, very precious about animals. So I'm like, oh, grandpa, why? Um, but he <clears throat> reckons that he was going to shoot an, an emu that was inside the, you know, inside their boundary fence and eating crops or whatever it was that was unacceptable and he ran out of bullets so he rode up alongside it on his horse and grabbed its head and pushed its neck onto the top of a barbed wire fence and killed it that way which is obviously not true um but i had to write it down because you know editorial um or you know i had to be impartial and just write things down so um i put a little note at the bottom saying i don't think this is true <clears throat> But then he had to get rid of, you know, then he said, what do I do with this dead emu? And um, his uncle who he lived with said, I don't know, get rid of it. And so he threw it in a pig pen and they apparently ate everything. There was no, there were no beaks or feathers or um, there was, there was no evidence left of that. And that sounded pretty horrifying to me. So I thought, hey, murder mystery novels need something horrifying in there. So I, hmm. there's, there's, so there's a touch to... of that in there. Get the book to find out how the pigs really actually feature in the story. Mm -hmm. um, do you know, I think we pretty, I think we pretty much, yeah, we're getting close to the end and we've got a couple more things to announce. The okay. winner um, of the competition okay. and also, did you want to announce the winner first? And then I've got something else to talk about for those crime lovers because October is just going to blow your minds. Sure. Okay, so is this is this my yeah my drum roll? Favorite? Yeah, drum roll. Okay, so we've got five people who got the right one there: Jane, Roland, Lisa, Cassandra, and I think I'm going to go with Carolyn Poole as our as our winner because because um, I had to choose someone, and I liked your the, I, your pleasing use of hedging language, where you didn't just say the server one's wrong; you said it doesn't feel right to me, and mm -hmm. the reason it doesn't feel right is because it was not right. So well done, Carolyn. And what does Carolyn win? Um, yeah, good question. What's Carolyn? Win? No, she wins <laughs> a, a copy, copy of the of, book. Of a Excellent. Book, um, which is called Death Leaves the Station by a guy called Alexander Thorpe, who I've heard good things about. Yeah, pretty witty guy, I've heard. I've heard. He's got a weird relationship with pigs, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, Alexander's book is one of four books that Fremantle Press have got publishing into October. Alexander's comes out on the 29th and in WA only um, this and three other books are being published uh, and they're available partly because there's a special crime promotion. So the books are, and for those crime lovers, there's posters behind me, 
Uh, but Alan Carter's new Nick Chester novel, which is number two in the series, um, from memory the first one was Marlborough Man, I think. Um, and the title of that is Doom Creek, this new one. So, And also Dave Warner's new crime novel, Dave Warner being WA guy but living in Sydney now. His new one is Over My Dead Body. And WA guy Dave Wish Wilson, his fourth in the Detective Frank Swan series, which is titled Sure Leave. Now, the good news is with so much excellent crime, which I have to say, over COVID, crime has been one of the most sought after novels through our store mm -hmm. and just looking at some of the, the figures coming through Nielsen as well. So it is a, a perfect time still to delve into it. Yeah. But you can buy one of those four books and you get to choose a free book from a selection of other books. The good news is this is actually available in pretty much every store in WA uh, participating in this promotion. Thanks to the wonderful support of Fremantle Press though. Um, for those people that would like to purchase Alexander's book, uh, you can purchase it on our website, which is beauffortstreetbooks.com.au. Street is the full word street. And if you are purchasing it tonight, just let us know that you're keen for the free book and we will send you a list of the free books that you can choose from. We'll have a dedicated page up uh, on release next uh, Monday, M M Tuesday, sorry, when the crime promotion starts. Um, you'll be able to go there and select which one of the the free books you like. So pretty cool. You know, pretty cool. Let, why stop good, at good one? Deal. Why stop at one? There's some right. fantastic books. So thank you for a lovely witty chat tonight. And thank yeah. you for writing um, the book. I, I really enjoyed reading it. I've, I've been away for a week um, down south. So it was a perfect book to take down there and... Um, delve into. So Beautiful. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. It's been very, very pleasant. But we've got a note coming up. Uh, we have the next conversation uh, like uh, as part of the Shot in the Dark is on Wednesday the 7th of October. I believe it's at 5.30, 5 o'clock um, Western Standard Time. So that's 7 p.m. Anyone over in the East Coast. And that one is going to be with Dave Warner which is going to be pretty exciting. And so then hopefully you're following the Fremantle Press Facebook page to see when the next two are. Thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy your evening. And we will see you again on Facebook Live soon. <laughs> see ya. <laughs> Do you want me to close this? <laughs> <laughs> Bye, folks. Oh, <laughs>